Hello, and welcome to Mystery Road. My name is Taylor. And my name is Donovan. Mystery Road is a monthly podcast that examines the dark, strange, and unknown. Want more updates on the show? Follow us on Instagram at Mystery Road Pod. Have suggestions and ideas for future shows? Email us at mysteryroadpod at gmail.com. Help support the show on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash mysteryroadpod. Now, let's take a stroll down Mystery Road. Blended families can evoke challenging emotions in children, particularly when they long for a sense of unity they once had. When children who may not fully comprehend the concept of divorce yearn to witness their parents together again, it can lead them down a path of disruptive behavior, and in some cases, rebellion. However, what about situations where this resentment goes beyond the norm? When families find it impossible to spend quality time together, jealousy can begin to seep in, revealing the darkest aspects of our personalities. This is exemplified in the story of a son who grappled with elements of his life beyond his control, which ultimately began to dominate him. The saga of the Lisk family paints a portrait of a profound loathing and resentment as they confront an overwhelming tide of anger. From an external perspective, the Lisk family appeared no different than any other. Nestled in a quiet rural town in North Ohio, William and his wife dedicated themselves to raising their only son, William Jr., BJ for short. He enjoyed a heavenly childhood, blessed with the love of his two doting parents in a city adjacent to a vast lake and surrounded by ample green spaces for a young boy's adventures. Their abode sat on expansive grounds with lush trees, spaceful lawns, and a serene waterfront, providing BJ with an abundance of natural wonders to explore. In this picturesque setting, BJ's happiness mirrored that of his content parents. This all-American family picture soon shattered when BJ's parents underwent a separation that cast a lingering shadow over his young life. The news of his parents' divorce marked a turning point, forcing him to divide his time at a tender age. In response, BJ's behavior took a drastic nosedive, manifesting in physical outbursts both at home and school, along with a profound shift in his attitude. He began to skip classes, engage in unruly behavior with the neighborhood children, thus tarnishing his own reputation. BJ fell in with a troubled crowd, succumbing to undesirable habits and finding solace away from his father's home, a stark departure from the happiness he once knew. In 2001, a few years following the divorce, William's heart found a new love. He entered into a marriage with Susan, who served as an office manager at the waste management company where he worked. William held high hopes that Susan would serve as a strong role model for his now 15-year-old son, who had grown into an unusually troubled teenager. However, Susan came with her own children, and she endeavored to blend their families together in hopes of easing BJ's transition into the new family dynamic. Regrettably, BJ harbored a deep-seated resentment towards her, likely stemming from his belief that she was attempting to supplement his biological mother. Susan's sons, Devin and Derek, were close in age to BJ, offering the potential for positive influence and companionship. Devin and Derek shared a common interest in their church activities, actively participating in the choir and attending services. Additionally, they found enjoyment in bonding with BJ through hunting. William often seized the opportunity to take all three young men on extended hunting excursions, providing a break from the pressures of everyday life. His aspiration was that these shared experiences would forge stronger connections among them, ultimately bringing the family closer when they returned to their home life. At this juncture in their lives, William began to discern the troubling changes in his son's behavior that were far more concerning than he initially perceived. Merely a year after his remarriage to Susan, BJ experienced a severe and alarming breakdown in his relationship with his father, unleashing a distressing deterioration in his mental health and well-being. During a heated argument with his father, BJ made alarming threats about harming himself, prompting William to take immediate action by contacting the police to ensure his son's safety. Subsequently, BJ was transported to a mental health facility for evaluation. 
a moment that starkly illuminated the gravity of his downward spiral. To William's dismay, BJ was released without receiving any treatment or intervention, intensifying his concerns and fears for his son's well-being. For a period, William's primary concern revolved around the apprehension that his son might never acclimate to his altered way of life. The relationship between father and son deteriorated progressively and BJ's conduct became increasingly vile even during his early teenage years. Susan, in her attempt to restore order in the household, imposed new rules upon BJ, but he harbored just as much resentment towards them as he did towards his parents for their separation during his formative years. Despite Susan's earnest efforts, BJ remained steadfast in his mindset, impervious to any change she pursued to effect. However, counsel from their circle of friends and family echoed a different sentiment. They advised patience and encouraged William and Susan to let BJ navigate the tumultuous waters of his teenage years. The consensus among those close to them was that BJ would eventually outgrow his challenging behavior. Susan and William would spend the next two years doing everything they could to control BJ's outbursts. However, BJ's outbursts would only intensify and soon become violent. Susan and William worried the rest of their family may be in danger and questioned if BJ should move out. In 2004, a mere two years after BJ's earlier hospitalization incident, another altercation, this time with Susan, turned violent culminating in him striking her in the chest with enough force to inflict a serious injury. As BJ transitioned into adolescence, his physical capabilities became potent enough to cause substantial harm. Susan became deeply unsettled as she grappled with the realization that she was living with someone whose behavior had become increasingly uncontrollable. At this juncture, Susan and William found themselves embroiled in a discussion about the viability of BJ continuing to reside with them. BJ harbored a deep-seated resentment towards Susan, and their growing apprehension was rooted in the expectation that his animosity would only escalate with time. His turbulent disputes within the household showed no signs of abating. Their concerns were gravely validated just two months later when BJ launched another brutal attack on Susan striking her forcefully in the face with a coffee mug before fleeing the scene with her car. At this point, Susan's worries extended beyond her son's behavior. She was genuinely afraid for her safety and well-being. Susan made every effort to create the illusion that BJ was still an integral part of their family. However, deep within her own heart, she harbored the certainty that BJ had no place alongside her own biological children. Although it posed an agonizing dilemma for her to choose between William and her own two children, the ongoing issues caused by BJ's behavior could not be disregarded. Shortly after the string of previous incidents, BJ launched another attack on his stepmother, catching her off guard while she was in the shower. This time, though, the aggressive nature of his actions seemed to suggest a more sinister intent both parents now grappling with the profound concerns about BJ's future trajectory and whether it would be safe to have him around at all. In 2006, William took the step of filing for full guardianship of his son with the aspiration of nurturing a more robust bond between them. Despite the persistent discord within the household, William remained resolute in his commitment to eventually cultivate a positive relationship with BJ. However, their volatile connection during BJ's teenage years took a further plunge when he received a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder in 2007. Schizoaffective disorder is a mental condition often characterized by the coexistence of symptoms associated with both schizophrenia and mood disorders. Those who receive a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder typically exhibit primary symptoms reminiscent of schizophrenia, including disorganized thinking, unclear thought patterns, delusions, and hallucinations that blur the boundaries between reality and their internal perceptions. Furthermore, when mood disorder symptoms manifest, individuals with schizoaffective disorder may experience extended periods of either manic or depressive states, sometimes lasting for several months at a stretch. 
Therefore, BJ's diagnosis carried significant gravity, offering various treatment options for him to consider. While schizoaffective disorder has no cure, medical professionals often prescribe medications to help manage symptoms such as delusions and related aggression. Additionally, they may recommend lifestyle adjustments, like abstaining from drugs and alcohol, to support the management of the condition. The extent to which BJ adhered to these recommendations remains uncertain. What is evident based on current research into mental disorders is that without intervention, the progression of his condition was likely to accelerate rapidly. Nevertheless, his father made continuous efforts to maintain contact with him and involve him with family affairs. At this point, it appeared that BJ's symptoms played a significant role in his inexplicable actions. Despite the family's earnest attempts to find a solution, no intervention seemed to make a discernible difference. While BJ attributed his aversion to the perceived authority his stepmother sought to assert in the household, his father took a firm stance against his behavior. Following each troubling incident at home, William promptly alerted the police, leading to BJ's removal from their residence. However, none of the charges resulted in lasting consequences for BJ, as he was later deemed either mentally incompetent or unfit to stand trial. Regrettably, despite his father's unwavering efforts, BJ's conduct remained impervious to change. Susan's two sons also struggled to establish a rapport with BJ, and their persistent attempts yielded no tangible results. BJ's presence in the household proved to be a perpetual source of disruption, generating conflicts with his stepmother and stepbrothers, and plunging the family into a relentless struggle. The prospect of unity seemed distant and unattainable, placing William in an agonizing predicament. Caught between his loyalty to his new wife and his enduring hope that BJ would eventually mend his ways, William found himself in a heart-wrenching dilemma. He clung to the belief that BJ might someday undergo a transformation, and as a result, he would never abandon his quest to reconcile both his role as a father and a husband. Every waking moment was spent in a tireless endeavor to evade the necessity of making a painful choice. A glimmer of hope emerged when BJ engaged in a series of treatment sessions aimed at helping him cope with his recent mental health diagnosis. Although the family provided BJ with their full support, he remained on a self-destructive path with his misconduct steadily intensifying. The issues he exhibited at home worsened, and he found himself entangled in increasingly serious legal troubles with local law enforcement. During his later teenage years, BJ's nights at his father's house became a rare occurrence. He found himself residing in a halfway home in Sandusky, as he was no longer welcomed into the family home. His past outburst, particularly against his stepmother, had led to a situation where they preferred to limit his presence to daytime hours. Susan's sense of safety was profoundly compromised in BJ's presence, and for the well-being of herself and her children, William made the difficult decision to restrict BJ's time with them. Whenever BJ was in the house, tensions soared with Susan constantly on guard, fearing that he might unexpectedly unleash another attack. BJ had just returned from a week-long camping trip and joined a nearby Halloween party with his friends. While at the party, BJ had several alcoholic drinks, and as the night wore on, BJ found himself in need of a ride back to the halfway house. Instead of making the long drive, his father made the unusual decision to allow him to spend the night in their home. This decision was a departure from William's typical rules, and regrettably, he decided to make an exception. While Susan harbored reservations about the decision, She ultimately concluded that one night would likely not pose any harm, and it would ensure BJ had a safe evening. Moreover, with one of her sons staying at his father's house, there was one less individual in the household for BJ to potentially clash with. Consequently, William and Susan reached an agreement that one night would suffice, and it would remain an isolated occurrence. On the morning of October 31, 2010, just before heading to church, Devin briefly stopped by his mother's house to change his shirt. Upon arriving home, he ran into BJ, who was laying on the couch. They had a quick exchange of words before Devin left. Sunday morning service ran later than usual, causing him to arrive back home later than anticipated. 
Upon his return, he noticed an unusual quietness enveloping the house, though he did not dwell on it. Devin proceeded to his room, spending several hours engrossed in video games and enjoying some solitude. Given that he had shared the home with only his younger brother and his parents, he assumed his younger brother had slept in, a common occurrence for boys their age. Likewise, he presumed that his parents had a late Saturday night and were using this particular Sunday for some well-deserved rest. After a considerable amount of time, Devin couldn't help but recognize that the prevailing silence within the house was far from ordinary. With the afternoon gradually advancing, not a soul had awakened, and there was no sign of activity emanating from beyond his bedroom door. It was Halloween, a day when he anticipated his parents would be bustling about, adorning the house and preparing for the evening's festivities. This growing unease prompted Devin to exit his room and venture towards his parents' bedroom, where he harbored the expectation of discovering them in a slumber. However, what he encountered in that room would etch a scarring image into his mind, one that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Upon entering his parents' room that morning, Devin couldn't help but feel unsettled by the complete absence of any activity, especially given the late hour. Initially, he attempted to wake them by calling out to them, but there was no response. Panic began to grip him, and he rushed over to his mother's side of the bed, attempting to shake her awake. Once again, there was no reaction. His apprehension mounting, Devin swiftly yanked the blanket off the bed, only to be met with a horrific sight, a quilt drenched in blood, concealing the lifeless forms of two individuals underneath. Frightened to the core, Devin dashed out of the house, his mind racing as he considered who to call for help. Uncertain about the status of his parents, Devin grappled with the haunting reality as the gruesome scene he had stumbled upon left him deeply disturbed. Though he couldn't be certain, he had a sinking feeling that what he had witnessed went far beyond mere injury. Faced with a harrowing dilemma, Devin made an immediate call to his aunt, Lori Morris, his voice trembling with panic. In a frantic explanation to his aunt, Devin conveyed the horrifying details of what he had encountered. In response, Lori promptly contacted the police urgently requesting their presence at the location. She wasted no time in rushing to the family home where she could care for her nephew. When the police finally arrived at the scene, the grim reality became painfully evident and there was no opportunity left for them to render life-saving assistance. The officers conducted a thorough perimeter search to ensure no potential perpetrators lingered nearby, but their efforts yielded no one in the vicinity. Yet amid the desolate quietude, a disconcerting clue emerged. Muddy footprints traced a path around the deck in the porch of the house, indicating that someone had made their way inside. It was a perplexing revelation, for there was no visible signs of a break-in or forced entry. Whoever was responsible for this heinous act had skillfully entered through the porch door, without leaving any conspicuous traces of their presence. Upon gaining access to the residence, law enforcement officers systematically cleared the first floor before proceeding upstairs to the master bedroom. Inside the bedroom, a chilling scene awaited them. William and Susan laid lifeless in their bed, their bodies in an unsettling state of repose. The bed remained meticulously made, with few signs of any disturbance within the room. The absence of any indication of a robbery became apparent as none of their belongings appeared to be missing. However, the grim truth quickly emerged. William had suffered multiple gunshot wounds to the head and face while Susan had encountered a sexual assault in addition to being shot. The investigators at the scene now faced the daunting task of conducting a comprehensive search of the property. The question now became, where was Derek, as he had been home the previous night? Attempting to access Derek's room, the investigators encountered an obstacle. The door handle was securely locked from the inside. Initially, they speculated whether Derek had taken refuge in his room upon hearing the distressing events unfolding in the house. However, as they entered, the scene they encountered offered no semblance of optimism. Inside the room, they observed Derek huddled on his bed, his back turned towards them, and his face pressed against the wall. Despite their attempts to engage him, there was no response. 
With mounting trepidation, the officers approached Derek only to discover a harrowing sight. Derek was lifeless on his bed, his head and upper body bearing extensive cuts and bruises. His demise had resulted from blunt force trauma to his head. Following their thorough examination of the crime scene, collection of pertinent evidence, and history with the family, police quickly wanted to find the whereabouts of BJ. The coroner's findings indicated a glaring absence of signs of struggle among all three victims, a chilling notion that further pointed to BJ's involvement. Devin, initially considered a suspect, was promptly ruled out when additional witnesses came forward. Neighbors residing on the same street reported hearing gunshots at approximately 6 a.m. that morning, at a time when Devin would have been in the company of his father, establishing his alibi. Further bolstering his innocence, Devin had a clean record with no prior police encounters, and his background offered no indication of him being capable of such a heinous act. During their search of the house, investigators stumbled upon a neatly made-up bed on the living room sofa, presumably prepared for BJ. As they sought to uncover clues about BJ's activities the previous night, they revisited their conversation with Devin. Devin revealed that morning when he returned home, he had conversed with BJ, who appeared unusually cheerful, a stark departure from his typical somber and withdrawn demeanor. BJ had inquired about Devin's plans and the duration of his stay at the house, but didn't delve further into the conversation. Devin noted that BJ seemed as though he had just woken up, given that he was still laying in his makeshift bed on the sofa. Devin informed investigators that he didn't engage in extensive conversations with BJ, even on the best of days, so their interaction was brief. After changing his shirt, he left for church and later returned to engage in video games, where he was met with an eerie silence. Police quickly realized BJ left with the family's Ford F-150 truck and was most likely making his way to a hunting cabin in Carroll County, a location he had frequented on prior occasions. It appeared as though he harbored the misguided hope of eluding law enforcement, though his endeavor would be futile. Merely an hour after BJ arrived at the cabin, law enforcement descended upon his location, taking BJ into custody and subsequently placing him under arrest for the brutal murders of his parents and stepbrother. The official police report showed William had sustained five gunshot wounds to the head and face, all fired from an approximate range of two feet. His body was discovered in a typical sleeping posture, with the covers drawn up over him. In stark contrast, Susan's position appeared more contorted, suggesting she might have been repositioned by the perpetrator. She had been shot three times at close range. These specific shooting distances held significant evidence in a court of law. Shooting from close proximity often conveyed a sense of animosity or an acrimonious relationship between the perpetrator and the victims. It was indicative of actions carried out against victims known to the assailant, highlighting the deeply personal nature of the crime. The pivotal breakthrough in unraveling this murder mystery hinged on the discovery of the murder weapons, responsible for the deaths of Derek, Susan, and William. A more exhaustive examination of Derek's case by the coroner pointed to the use of a claw hammer as the murder weapon. Consequently, investigators embarked on a thorough search of the entire property, intent on locating this crucial piece of evidence. Inside the house, they discovered a blood-stained claw hammer and meticulously preserved it as evidence. However, despite their painstaking efforts, no firearm was recovered from within the house or the immediate vicinity of the property. Even after draining a nearby pond in their pursuit, no firearm emerged. The deployment of weapon-sniffing dogs likewise yielded no leads connecting BJ to the crime. What investigators did discover was an untouched Subway sandwich resting on the counter within the Carroll County cabin. Substantiating this find, security footage taken as evidence from a nearby Subway restaurant clearly depicted BJ purchasing the sandwich earlier that morning. Shortly thereafter, BJ faced charges of aggravated murder in each of the deaths, as determined by the Ottawa County Common Pleas Court. The outcome of BJ's trial hinged significantly on his mental condition. Should medical professionals deem him unfit to stand trial, he would be obligated to undergo treatment at a rehabilitation center until deemed competent. 
Initially, BJ was remanded into custody with a formidable $3 million bond and subsequently relocated to Erie County Jail. In November 2010, BJ faced the daunting charge of three counts of aggravated murder, and he entered a plea of not guilty for each of these charges. While awaiting his second trial date, he confronted the stark reality of Ohio's application of the death penalty, which meant if found guilty, he could potentially face an execution date. However, in a significant turn of events during his pre-trial hearing, BJ altered his plea to guilty for three counts of aggravated murder. This plea was contingent on the removal of the death penalty from his sentence. Ultimately, BJ was convicted and subsequently handed down three life sentences with no chance of parole. In a somber moment before the court, he offered his apologies, addressing the remaining members of his family. Regrettably, his remorse would prove ineffectual. Tragically, in March 2015, at the age of 29, BJ was discovered lifeless in his prison cell, a victim of self-inflicted wounds. It's truly heart-wrenching to encounter situations where family members resort to violence against their own kin. Additionally, it's distressing to contemplate that had BJ received the necessary assistance at the time of his mental health diagnosis, much of this tragedy might have been prevented. While it's important to emphasize that not all individuals with schizoaffective disorder commit such heinous acts, it is undeniably challenging to ignore the role that his severely compromised mental state played in the events that transpired within his home that fateful morning. The questions surrounding whether BJ planned this murder, or if an unforeseen trigger propelled him into committing such heinous acts, may forever elude us. Investigators lean towards a premeditative motive, drawing from the family's turbulent history and BJ's prior altercations with his stepmother. However, in the absence of BJ's own testimony, the true nature of the event remains shrouded in mystery. That's it for this episode. Thank you all very much for taking the time to listen to our podcast. You all voted and we listened. Next month, join us as we travel to the Navajo tribal land to investigate the bone-chilling skinwalker. If you like our content, please like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Mystery Road Pod and Facebook at Mystery Road. Also, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Mystery Road Pod to help support the show. If you have any ideas for future shows, email us at mysteryroadpod at gmail.com. Links will be in the show notes.